Welcome back to our final two sessions today. We'll now go to Stanford University to Scott Rosell and his team. Our program link with our agenda and all of our speaker bios is in the chat box. A pre-read paper from Huang Wang on this topic was also sent to you earlier. This session is on rural China's most severe epidemic, depression, anxiety, and new ways to foster resilience in school, home, and community. Here now is moderator Shin Liu. She's an advisory board member at Stanford Center on Philanthropy and Civic Society, the co-founder of the Enlight Foundation and an Asian Society Groundbreaker member. Shin Liu, thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, mental health struggle impacts people of all ages in all places, from young moms in rural China to high school students in Silicon Valley. What is the most alarming about our evolving understanding of this silent pandemic is the high rate of anxiety and depression among our youth around the globe. Enlight Foundation's pre-COVID map showed that nearly one third of youth have experienced depressive symptoms and COVID-19 made the situation worse across all indicators. During the COVID-19 outbreak, an online survey reported that more than 43% among Chinese high school students had depressive symptoms suggesting an increase in mental disorders. China has about 420 million children aged from zero to 14. There are average one pediatrician for every 5,000 children. And there are only 500 full-time child psychiatrists in the whole country who are concentrated in first year cities. There are close to no child psychiatry services in rural China. And the severe shortage affects the timely det detection and management of psychiatric disorders among Chinese children, especially among the 60 million left behind children. This is a serious problem. Today, I have the honor to introduce to you a great team that I've collaborated with in the past few years to share their findings and experiments in prevention and treatment. Our first speaker is Scott Rosell. Professor Rosell is a senior fellow and the Stanford FSI for International Studies. He spends most of his time co-directing Stanford's newest center, SKY, which stands for Stanford Center for China's Economy and Institutions. He's also the director of the Rural Education Action Project, REAP. Currently, his work on poverty focuses on human capital in rural China. Our second speaker is Manpri Singh, and Dr. Singh is an associate professor of psychiatry and behavior sciences at Stanford School of Medicine. She leads a multidisciplinary team that aims to test and innovate novel diagnostic and treatments in youth. Dr. Singh is now leading a number of the research initiatives in SKY's new programs, including mental health and learning in rural schools in China. Huan Wang and Xin She will join the conversation and answer questions during the Q&A session. Huan Wang is a research scholar at the Stanford Center on China's Economy and Institutions. Her research focuses on assessing educational quality and identifying effective educational programs and policies to improve student outcomes in rural China. By conducting large-scale randomized controlled trials, she evaluates the impact of social emotional learning on reducing dropouts and improving mental health in rural junior high schools. Xin She is a professor and clinical pediatrician in Stanford School of Medicine. She has studied at or received degrees from University of Pennsylvania, John Hopkins, Harvard School of Public Health, and Harvard School of Medicine. Currently, she is leading an international collaboration trial in Shanghai assessing the impact of mindfulness and mentoring on migrant youth resilience. Scott, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sheen, and um, thank you, uh, Rexel and Margaret and uh, James, the, ho the whole staff. This is a, a privilege to be here. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to quickly share, uh, paint you the landscape that we're working in um, the mental health of children in rural China and uh, the association with learning. Um, and it, it, my name's up there, but this is work that's been done by the whole group that's here with uh, 
with the two Xins and Manpreet and, and Wahan. So um, uh, uh, we can also join in the discussion together. Actually, in, in Liu Xin's very short uh, uh, introduction, she uh, gave half my talk here. So it's uh, uh, because it's, I mean, it, it, we've done this together. We're almost the only group that's really looking at mental health in schools in rural China. Um, uh, one out of every nine children in the world are in rural China, um, but there's almost zero studies of mental health uh, in, in rural China. Thousands in China in general, but rural China in particular, there's thousands of published every year on child and mental health in the U.S., but but not in China. And uh, I, uh, Liu Xin has already told you about, I mean, there's 500 child psychologists in the entire country with 420 million, you know, children. That, that's just uh, one for every 100 million, <laughs> for, for every uh, t 10 million kids in, in China. So um, it's, a, it's a real, real problem. Um, um, we saw this problem. We actually saw the problem a while back. <laughs> and I'll show you then there was almost no interest from the Ministry of Education, that's changing now inside China as, as suddenly it's moved up into the spotlight, probably enhanced by COVID, uh, et cetera. And um, what we're gonna try to do is, I'm gonna tell you most about the problems, but like Juan said, and and like we're doing with Manpreet and, and Sheen, um, that we not only like to identify problems, we're a group that tries to find solutions, okay? Uh, let, let me go through these quickly. Um, We've actually screened more than 50,000 kids across almost 15 provinces, uh, central, western China in migrant schools, and there's 20% of those schools uh, have 20% uh, of the kids in these schools, so that's out of the 50,000 kids, almost 10,000 of them are at risk of, for depression. <laughs> Not only that, 68% of them have one type of anxiety or more, and which is... Uh, 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 sort of a, a precursor, a co-symptom of depression and stress and, and other mental health uh, problems. Um, uh, you, you wonder why a large share of kids are having problem in school? Well, you know, there's uh, an ADHD problem that we've identified in the U.S. that we spend a lot of time working on. There's just as big of a problem in, in China, um, uh, almost Seven, eight percent of the kids, um, you know, we have been shown to have ADHD or related symptoms. Yet there's zero, zero programs in rural Chinese schools to to uh, address these issues. Um, and you know, in another big another big study, fifteen percent of the sample uh, of the sample students had emotional problems, behavioral problems, conduct problems. Uh, and and three out of four of the students that we identified said at least once in the past month they had been bullied that you know because their parents are gone uh, about a, a quarter of the kids live in school there's almost no very very low sort of monitoring of those kids and you know kids when they get together in these atmospheres you can see um here's here's international huh, sort of study um what ranks Ch rural china versus the whole world the lower you are uh the, the more bullying there is it's, it's china is barely ahead of south south africa in in terms of that it's one of the worst places in the world and guess what <laughs> adhd depression anxiety stress emotional problems um, and all of those take its toll on academic performance. And he, this is the relationship between those who have these problems and uh, the, the learning relationships between them. You can see that they that it takes a huge toll on on their learning. Okay. Um, so what can we do to improve these? That's the bad news. Okay. We're criticized for right, revealing negative results. Um, but at REAP, we conduct empirical multidisciplinary research 
to try to find solutions. Then we, of course, we're economists. Um, so that's why we go out and get Man, the Manpreets and the Xin Shus of the world to come and really work with us and, and, and then our collaborators inside China uh, to do this. Um, and so we're just at the beginning of phase of finding solutions. And this is what we do, is we do randomized controlled trials. So we'll go to 100 schools and then we'll randomly split them into 50 and 50. And in 50 schools, we give them a treatment of some type. Uh, an intervention. And in, in, in 15, they, they don't get any. We, so we measure them there. We then give them the intervention. We wait a, a semester, a year. We then do a follow-up and compare the impacts on not only the is there a reduction in the mental health problems, but what happens to learning, uh, et, et cetera. Um, um, we did this eight years ago, nine years ago. Wang Huan actually ran this in a, in a really poor area of Northern Shanxi, right on the inner Mongolian border. And we were in 70 schools uh, and 7,000 students. And we measured their baseline at very high levels of anxiety. Lots of kids were dropping out of, of school. Um, the intervention group, so about 3,500 of them, we gave them this curriculum of social emotional learning. How do you deal with these problems? And there was one on one counseling for those 3,500 students. For the other 3,500, uh, we introduced the program in the third year. And look what happens in, at the end of the first semester. There was a big negative impact on, on anxiety. So in other words, anxiety went down in the treatment group versus the control group. It helped these kids. By the second semester, there was no impact. It's fade out away. So, but look at, look at and, you know, when the kids were less anxious and more focused on school and their learning went up, they stayed in school. Dropout rates fell dramatically from junior high dropouts, that is. But by the second semester, there was no impact, you know. And so what happened? You know, what, why teachers and students enjoyed this? It worked for a while. But the problem was, is this wasn't a, a key, wasn't a high priority in schools. And after the first year, after sort of the, 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 uh, the, the, the excitement wore off, the principal said, let's get back to school. We don't want to have these anymore. We're going to do more math review. And right, they got right back to where they were. Now, more recent policies from the Ministry of Education has requested schools to improve mental health. Why? Over the past couple of years, there's a report from Peking University that shows 100,000 students every year commit suicide in China, one every five minutes. Okay, uh, that's got people's attention now. Um, and so it, that, you know, it's a terrible thing, but at least it's raised awareness now. And so we're trying to create this collaborative team at Stanford and then our colleagues in, in the best universities in China, at Fudan, at Shanghai Jiao Tong University, Capital Medical University, at Western University in Sichuan. And, and together, we're, we're going to be working on a series of projects on resilient, social, emotional learning, mindful practices. Um, and uh, the idea is, is let's start when kids are younger. Um, and and uh, Manpreet is going to talk to you just about this. I, uh, I'm an economist. I know how to measure. Uh, Manpreet and Shin are the uh, uh, are the pediatricians and the psychologists. They'll tell you more about this. But the idea is, how do we take kids and build resilience so they can get through, cope with, adapt to, and overcome the adversity of their lives? Um, as you see at the baseline, rural kids in China. Um, uh, are among the most non-resilient kids in the whole world. So we, we have our work cut out for us. But if we can increase resilience, is this at the baseline? We see huge impacts on, on learning. And so that's where we're going. Uh, I'm going to hand the floor over uh, to Manpreet. Um, and um, sh she's going to now, I guess, uh, tell you now what we're really going to do. <laughs> and um, and uh, she's helping us develop the program that we're going to implement uh, as such. OK, uh, thank you very much, everyone. It's been, a, been. Thank you, Scott. And thank you to the Asia Society for giving me the opportunity to uh, share my work. I think that um, 
this will give you an opportunity to see um, what we can do in America and perhaps apply in a different setting. Um, although for me, it's very important to have some cultural sensitivity. And so I'm very, very eager to learn from you all what the possibilities are in um, rural use in China. These are my uh, research um, uh, funding sources, as well as um, uh, advisory and consultation uh, sources. So I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I went to medical school and did a pediatrics residency, a residency in psychiatry and then child and adolescent psychiatry. And kids come to my office very often and say, um, and the parents say, my kid, he is says he's depressed. I already took his phone away. Is there anything else I can do to get him out of this phase? It feels very much like in this world, we're beginning to understand it's not just about technology, that there are complex factors that contribute to why a child might be depressed or anxious. And we are very interested and motivated in understanding those ground level uh, sources of stress um, and also biological factors that contribute. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, I think that Dr. Rizal did a fantastic job framing the problem. And I wanna to focus today on potential solutions and ways that we think about solutions. And um, as a pediatrician, my lens is always thinking from a primary prevention perspective, if we can head it off through an early identification of symptoms and intervene before uh, the problem becomes even more uh, problematic, can we potentially uh, imagine that we are able to prevent lifelong mood disorders? That's exactly what my career is focused on trying to understand. The other problem that we face is that those who are already symptomatic, who are very depressed, who are depressed for lifetime uh, extended periods, um, don't have any great interventions. So we have very little good treatments um, for very, very bad or more severe conditions. So we need to innovate more on um, those uh, cohort of individuals so that we can um, have them lead um, better and more fulfilling lives. Even before the, um, uh, uh, that, uh, the, the onset of symptoms, we have key opportunities to potentially intervene uh, preemptively for those potentially at risk for lifelong mood disorders or in pre-symptomatic stages. And of course, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had biomarkers, diagnostic tests that we could use, whether they are genetically oriented polygenic risk scores combined with family histories. Currently, our gold standard uh, of diagnosing um, symptomatic youth is by um, uh, an evaluation by an expert or, or um, a professional, someone like me. And uh, as, as Dr. Rizal alluded to earlier, there are very few of me around in the world um, besides um, psychiatrists, um, let alone child and adolescent psychiatrists. There are very few child and adolescent psychologists and other mental health professionals who can be at the front line. So we partner with um, Dr. Xin Shi and other primary care doctors to help us. But even then the burden and the demand is far uh, too great to be able to meet that unmet need. So a diagnostic test or some form of biomarkers would be tremendously helpful. But I'm wondering about other possible ways to intervene. And I'm wondering about what are our naturally inborn resources? What are the things that we have within our bodies and minds that can potentially be leveraged or enhanced to, in effect, um, uh, uh, combat uh, the evolution of uh, mood symptoms? And I think that looking for those intrinsic capacities to heal, our capacity to repair, our capacity to adapt to stress is a potential intriguing solution. So we, we call that broadly speaking resilience and how we define it is we of course uh, embrace it as a complex and dynamic process. It's the ability to adapt successfully to adversity, stressful life events, significant threat or trauma and it is on a continuum. It has the capacity to be cultivated with the potential for change 
across the lifespan. So it's never too late to shore up those resources. It's never too late for youth, and it's never too late for their caregivers, for their parents, grandparents, and extended family members. It's also not too late for, for communities to be shored up to resource their individuals who are at risk and be able to rally to support their mental health needs. So what makes humans resilient? What are the fundamental substrates of adaptation? Well, some of these things are truisms, things that we already know. Um, and behavioral neuroscience has done a terrific job validating and providing scientific evidence for them. In fact, there's a great monograph by Dr. Anthony Bigelin, who's a prevention scientist um, at Oregon, uh, uh, that he wrote called The Nurture Effect, that I highly recommend if you're interested more in understanding the essential, essentially substrates of, of healing and resilience. And what he says is that we have it within us to be able to um, address most of the uh, 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 international <laughs> um, problems that we face. I say this very uh, casually, but it's a reality that the way that we fight the pandemic is through our behaviors. Essentially, even before the vaccine, we were able to contain the virus just by, by simple behaviors like masking and physical distancing and washing our hands and being mindful of vulnerabilities and um, at-risk populations by protecting them through that behavior, through the behavior of cooperation. And in the same way, I think we can address mental health symptoms and vulnerabilities as well, because one of the key essential factors to mitigating the progression of mood symptoms and social isolation is building a community. And you'll see that represented in, in one of these 10 truisms that my colleagues at Mount Sinai Health System have developed. Keep a positive attitude. Optimism is always very helpful in cultivating um, hope um, and, and a positive uh, frame of mind. Reframe stressful thoughts. Think of them as opportunities. Develop a moral compass. Find a resilient role model. Face fears head on. Direct, develop active coping skills. And establish and nurture a supportive social network. I'm going to be focusing on this as well as ways that the brain can be trained today so that you have some ideas about how we can tangibly roll up our sleeves to address the mental health challenges that our youth in China face. Prioritize physical well-being, exercise, tons and tons of data that support um, the value of exercise. And the personal anecdote um, is, is that when I was 16, I was sleeping a bunch and I told my mom in, a, in, a, in, a, in my own hypochondriasis, I think I have cancer, I think I'm dying. And she said, no, you just need to exercise. I don't believe you, mom, take me to the doctor. So she took me to a pediatrician. What did the pediatrician say? Exercise. I learned at, as an adolescence that exercise is essential, I started to exercise and I found the positive mood elevating effects of exercise and, and it's become my lifelong go-to strategy to lift my mood. So these are things, if they can be learned early, can be uh, innate ways for us to adapt our behaviors towards more resilient outcomes. Training our brain towards those behaviors is an emerging science. We've learned a lot about the brain in the last uh, several decades. And so now we can figure out ways to leverage the resources that are in our brain because at the end of the day, mood and anxiety symptoms are brain-based. They're not a, a social construct. They're not, um, a, uh, they're stigmatized primarily because people blame um, uh, people for behaviors rather than focusing on ways that we can understand the brain and how these behaviors um, emerge so that we can reframe them. And so this um, you know, uh, particular monograph is a nice summary of ways that we can engage with resilient behaviors. It's also true that we have across species demonstrated that there are biological capacities, intrinsic capacities. In fact, the brain is the most genetically determined organ of the brain of the body. And because it has the most genes, it has the most potential for plasticity or change over the lifetime. That in itself is an opportunity. That means that we have the capacity to evolve. 
what it also means is that our genetic makeup is vulnerable to external or environmental stress. This is the root of the nature and nurture debate. But in this recent um, work, uh, again, by folks at Mount Sinai, there's a demonstration that there's actually a gene network in the brain that activates in animals that are confronted with social defeat stress. That network activates and prevents the ensuing stress and, um, uh, and depressive symptoms that are observed, um, helplessness and other forms of, uh, of defeat and, and depression that are modeled in animals. So we, can, we have clues that we can learn from to be able to understand and target very specifically ways to promote resilience. In my lab, we focus on a family history model. Here are my kids who, who illustrate for you that on any given day, we all have good days and bad days. My kids are, thank goodness, touch wood, um, typically developing in, in most ways. Um, they, have their, they had their toddler tantrums. They had their conflicts. Right now, I'm a referee for many, many interpersonal conflicts between them. But what we've done in our lab is to take a look at a family history model as a model system for understanding those vulnerabilities a little bit more closely, particularly in families affected by depression and other mood disorders like bipolar disorder. And what we found is that indeed, if you have a parent with depression or bipolar disorder or other mood conditions, your brain is much more prone, your, your child's brain is much more prone to feeling um, stress and having the ensuing disconnections in your brain. And so in the offspring, in healthy offspring of parents with bipolar disorder who don't have any symptoms at all, even before they develop symptoms, their brains are already showing evidence of disconnections compared to healthy youth who don't have a family history of any mood problems. This led us to do a larger risks and resilience study where we examined a, a, a larger group of offspring of parents with bipolar disorder, offspring of parents with depression, and offspring of healthy parents without any psychiatric conditions. And we've now been following them for almost a decade. And what we found is that in these youth who have parents with mood problems, they're at higher risk for developing conditions like depression and anxiety, just by virtue of having a parent with a mood disorder. And their brains are likely to be showing disconnectivities in areas that are very important for reward processing, um, processing things like, do I want more TV? Do I want more food? And, and finding and relishing in those kinds of rewards versus um, processing emotions, um, happy, sadness, neutral um, emotions. And so what we found is those offspring still healthy of parents with mood disorders, their brains show different patterns compared to controls in areas of the brain that process rewards and emotions. And it's also true that more family rigidity leads to more symptom um, risk. And we've also found that um, those who have um, difficulties processing emotions are more likely to experience peer problems, interpro interpersonal problems, making friendships, and are much more likely to convert, go from a healthy state to developing a mood or anxiety disorder. There's another side to this story, in fact. Um, in Just as those vulnerabilities are present, there are a lot of kids in that same cohort who are also demonstrating evidence of resilience. And the brain networks that are likely to um, to demonstrate a resilience pattern are more connected. The disconnected are, are evidencing more uh, risk for mood and uh, anxiety disorders and peer problems. The more connected brains are showing evidence of more cooperation, capacity for pro-social behaviors. So we wondered if we could train the brain to, to shore up those resources that are very helpful in interpersonal relationships and building friendships and cultivating um, uh, resilience, how, how would that um, potentially play a role in preventing the ensuing psychiatric symptoms that um, could happen if, if those um, skills or brain uh, resources were not there? 
we actually did a family-focused therapy inter intervention in offspring of parents with bipolar disorder who experience a lot of chaos in their family environment because of the bipolar condition in their parents. And what we found is early evidence that if you in, in fact impact the family environment in a positive way by training the brain and training the families to communicate more and to be more pro-social, the brain network connectivities that look like they were vulnerable are starting to connect again. What does that look like? What does that intervention look like? Well, there's two types of interventions that we could offer. When folks go to Dr. Shin Shi and the pediatrician's office, she would probably start off with some education about what symptoms of depression and anxiety might look like. That's called psychoeducation or enhanced care. But if you add some skills, communication skills and problem solving skills, these are inherently pro-social behavior training skills. Combine the education with the behavioral training and you have what we call family focused therapy. It's in the cultivation of pro-social behaviors that I think it's, is key for uh, enhancing and producing resilient outcomes. And when we did compare family-focused therapy to just psychoeducation and alone in a randomized controlled trial in offspring of parents with bipolar disorder who already developed symptoms, we found that family-focused therapy compared to just educating alone, so the added behavioral components were critical, delayed the recurrence of depression in those youth by many, many weeks. So we can see the evidence of preventative effects. And it's also evident in the brain. The brain networks are looking like they're differentially connected in um, youth at high risk compared to healthy controls. And when you give them the family-focused therapy, that enhances the connectivities. And that enhancement of connectivity leads to improvement in depressive severity. So in other words, you've now trained the brain and you've reduce the symptoms and you've changed the outcome. That's how I think therapy, any kind of therapy works, whether it's mindfulness or family-based interventions, it's implicitly designed to improve emotion regulation. In the case for family-focused therapy, it targets the parental expressed emotion, the difficulties that they feel in parenting, it treats the system. It improves the quality of the family relationships and enhances its physical well-being because it trains people on how to be helpful in general. There's an interactive effect. So if those kids who are already symptomatic who are on medications or parents who are on medications, this allows for reinforcement of those the needed treatments by enhancing adherence to those treatments. But what's most intriguing to me is the capacity for us to um, change the brain, the capacity for neuroplasticity, which can lead to improved functioning and improvement in prosocial behavior. So for use in China, I think about what are the factors that are contributing to symptoms and trigger? How can we promote healthy diets, physical exercise, that physical well-being aspect, regulate kids' sleep, teach youth to train their brains through mindfulness or other activities that help them shore up those connectivities in the brain that are so essential for adaptive brain development. And how do we help them have uh, you know, healthy relationships with technology and combine the resources that are available inside of them with resources that are offered to them um, through, uh, through either care or services um, that are potentially available if they are symptomatic. And when do we do this? I think that this starts at preconception. Even before parents are getting ready to have children, they should be trained on these principles so that they can help nurture their children effectively. So that's my uh, story. And I'd like to acknowledge my village um, at Stanford uh, for all of the work that they've done to help me share um, this incredible science that I think um, not only conveys um, a, a, a very coherent story on how we can promote resilience, but it also conveys hope. And finally, I just want to convey to you that I have done a recent podcast um, in the spirit of re-entry re into a new academic year. Lots of questions about how do you manage and cope with COVID 
Um, it, it reflects a personal story, but also just other solutions that I think parents and families and teachers can engage with. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everybody. Um, please post your questions at the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, let me ask the first question for our panelists. So what resources are available to school children in rural China to address mental health problems? I, I can, I can uh, you know, take on that, this one. Um, so when we talk about mental health problems in rural China, the first problem is the awareness. Uh, when kids show like, you know, sleepiness and like not, you know, can't focus this kind of, you know, alarming symptoms, usually the kids themselves, they don't know. And when they talk to their parents, either their parents are away, you know, working in the cities, these kids are left behind in rural China, 60 million of them, or they, their parents just like, you know, they don't have this kind of level of awareness that, um, you know, this is kind of, you know, mental health issue, I should, you know, take my um, kids to chat to be, you know, checked by a doctor. So usually parents just blame the kids to be lazy and not studying hard. So that's the first you know, problem that we encounter at home. So at home, I would say not much resources to help these rural students. And in school, even though the policy actually requires every rural school to be equipped with a um, what they call mental health teacher, but there's a huge shortage of teacher in rural schools. So usually this kind of rule is um, um, act by like a music teacher or a um, PE teacher, which they are not you know, equipped with the proper training in um, psychology or any kind of mental health related training. So in school, you know, the school and teachers are not able to really help the students to deal with this kind of mental health issues. And the third part would be the, um, you know, the, the healthcare provider in rural China. As we all, you know, REAP has been, you know, researching on this area for a long time to evaluate the, you know, the healthcare quality in rural China. The, um, you know, the doctors in rural China, they can't even, you know, um, get the diagnosis for, you know, just common, you know, diarrhea or cold or, you know, anything right. So there's just really no um, professional psychology that is in the rural area av available for, for these uh, rural students. As Scott mentioned in a talk, even in the entire country of China, there are only 500 children psychiatrists. So there's a huge shortage of healthcare providers in mental health. So at home, in school, and also in the you know, healthcare um, system, there's, this, you know, every part you look at, there's a, there's a, you know, shortage of resource on this issue. Yeah, I would just add, Wang, in my observation of, uh, in our discussion, it's, it's particularly acute in rural China because of the broader um, shortages of mental health, but the global challenge of, um, shortage, I mean, this is a universal shortage. Uh, it's uh, actually true here too in America that we have a shortage of child and adolescent psychiatrists. So, um, and, and mental health, pro allied mental health professionals um, as well. Though the, the, um, the group is growing, it's unfortunately not growing at the pace that we would need. So I think that there is a need for curriculum development. And again, resourcing ourselves with perhaps digital technology or other ways of disseminating more broadly so that we can at least address primary prevention strategies through a way that allows for access in a more universal fashion. And at least my observation after the pandemic is that many of my colleagues have left Stanford to go join startups that essentially leverage digital tech to try to get those pieces, those key ingredients together and in my view, that that's not a, a bad strategy or pivot. I think that we have to work in partnership to create informed curriculum and, uh, and digital health technologies that um, not only promote health and well-being, 
but also are, um, are, are, are sensitive to the potential risks that are out there when identifying youth um, in a setting that is naturally under-resourced. Thank you. Um, I start to see a couple of questions in the Q&A box. And the first one is more technical. It's asking how the data you have provided translate to the US versus developed countries. Um, I guess Juan or Scott can answer this question. Go, go ahead, Juan. Take the first shot at that if you want. And then I, I'll, I just have one thing to add. Yeah, so um, I think, you know, the other way to think about this question is why do rural, um, you know, human capital quality matters to China or to other developed, uh, developed countries like, you know, here in the US. So Scott, at REAP, we have this, you know, whole um, kind of, you know, theory background for all the research we're doing is um, rural China that, you know, student, the, um, the population, children population that grown up in rural China accounts for three quarters of China's future labor force. So if we don't pay attention to the mental health issues among these uh, rural students in the future, um, you know, they will not be able to contribute to China's growth. And that in return will, you know, be a threat to, you know, the economy of China and also you know, the entire world. Yeah, and, and I think that that's true in every country. Um, you know, I think that, um, um, so uh, our group, one thing we do every June is we have a high school internship group. Um, and this year we had 19 high school students and they were from, uh, they were from China and they were from the US and um, they were together and, and we broke them into five groups um, and they actually write a paper. We teach them how to, how to do statistics and how to do lit review and how to write. And they create a paper after a month long internship. It's a, it's a great thing. Two of our groups were on mental health and Manpreet and Juan gave a talk very much like today, but to, to these high school students. And then we had discussion questions. And this is trying to get it where, and it was what was I thought was really interesting is that the students in the US, they, we said, what's it like in your schools? And the students in the US said, says, we're really open about mental health problems. We have counselors, we, our teachers are aware of that. Uh, we talk to each other. And if, if we see a friend is down, we, we encourage that friend to go to, into counseling. And Wow, you know, when, when my kids were in school, my kids are now in their 30s. My that wasn't true when my kids in the school. And and you know, when I was in school, it you know, mental health was a nasty word, right? Um, and then our Chinese colleagues came in and basically said, Oh, it's like when Professor Roselle was in school, where is it's you can't even talk about it. A couple of the international schools says, it's okay to talk about, but what, what, I, what I really found was that it's this openness that finally has penetrated here. And that's sort of what we need to really find out in the rest of the world. We have to make this a more open thing that we can talk about. And I think that that's a lot of the, those, those 10 issues that, that uh, Manpreet introduced. So um, I, know, I know Dr. Ashin has done a lot of work elsewhere, so maybe you could um, answer this too. Yeah, that's a fascinating question. It's one that I've thought about a lot because I have worked in Latin America and Haiti and rural China. Um, I think a lot of these findings that um, we, uh, is uh, discovering are very applicable to the U.S. Uh, we have seen it over 25% increase in teenage suicide during COVID in San Francisco city, one of the richest cities in the world. Um, and um, a lot of parents tell me they're on a waiting list to see a psychologist for six months. So this is definitely still a problem in the U.S., maybe not a, on the absolute scale compared to ch rural China, but um, uh, and what has been mentioned by Juan at the different levels, like family level, school level, and um, uh, the stigma that's mentioned um, by Scott is very much still present in the US, especially for uh, minority students. I think um, recently with the um, hate crimes that's happening toward Asian Americans, especially um, with LGBTQ communities, 
um, a lot of issues are still not on the table. Um, so we know that, for example, um, LGBT teenagers are four times likely to commit suicide during teenage years compared to the um, straight or binary um, peers. So there are a lot of communities in the US that need the similar type of attention. And what we find in China in terms of what interventions can work to increase resilience is very much translatable to developed contexts. Thank you. Um, there's an excellent question here. Is it possible to expand mental health care in China through telehealth in rural China? Ma'am Preet, do, do, what, about, what do you know about it here? And then um, I have yeah. a little anecdote about telehealth in, in China. I'd love to hear more about that too, because my instinct is to say abundantly with abundant enthusiasm, yes, yes, yes. Um, if there are, you know, if there's a technological solution, then um, you know this could be um, a way to disseminate. And in fact, the experience in America is that probably um, the pandemic has made it. Uh, a little bit more acceptable, both for clinicians and for patients to um, embrace uh, telehealth formats. There's still folks that need to be seen in person, but um, for a variety of reasons, um, telehealth does increase and improve access. It, um, it can potentially um, destigmatize um, by giving people, you know, get again, again, more convenience. And so, and, and then those folks who were driving three, four hours to see me for consultation are able to now just hop on and log on to a screen. So in, in far reaches and corners of, of, of America, telehealth has become a very useful tool. Um, and as I said, with everything, there's balance, um, there's pros and cons, um, but I'll, I'll leave it there. I, I think that there's, this has changed the, uh, it's been a game changer, I think, for the field of psychiatry and psychology and other mental health uh, professions to be able to, um, to digitize uh, some of the interventions. So, so um, our group, um led by our colleague in the University of North Carolina is doing a very large um, uh, randomized control trial on telemedicine, not with mental health, but with um, angina, with diarrhea, uh, with TB, and there's a couple other, a couple other diseases. And um, uh, uh, we're doing two different things. One, we're putting fake patients into the telemedicine uh, thing and how good are they versus the local doctors? And the answer is is most of them get really uh, get significantly better care in telemedicine. So it, so the, the one patient will say, doctor, doctor, I, 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 I've been coughing for a month and I have a fever at night. Um, you know, if you go to a doctor, uh, in, in a rural area, they'll say, take some aspirin and go home, you know, and it's TV, of course. And then, it, but in the, the telemedicine, yeah. The, pro, the second part of our big trial then is, can we get doc, can we get patients to buy into that? And the problem is, is, is embedded in the healthcare system. It's, first of all, most rural people don't have, a, you know, an iPad, <laughs> Mac, Pro, MacBook Pro, that and an internet that they can log on and don't have the, the you know can't say telemedicine.com and and get on it. So they have to go to a provider who's set up with machines. The problem there then is is there's no referral fee. So the local provider, unless you give him a huge incentive to refer him on to the tele telemedicine, is they won't do it. And so we put these. MacBook Pros in 50 clinics and didn't and just said when you have problem uh, diagnosing this you should do telemedicine and then the patient actually says can I get on telemedicine and the doctor says no the, it, it doesn't work um, it actually works but the, if you pay the, the if you pay the provider to to refer them on to telemedicine, they do it immediately and they get much, much better care. So there's lots of, there's, we gotta get the systems figured out, but I think there's just really a lot of potential there. And of course, with 500 child psychologists and, and 
you know, just a handful more of regular psychologists, this telemedicine for mental health is going to be extremely important. Thank you. Um, I see another wonderful question from Jay Xu. Um, it's talking about Simone Biles courageously withdraw herself from Olympic because of mental issues. How can this experience be helpful to kids with mental health challenges in China or anywhere else? I think I'll take that one. I've been talking about it with my husband. Uh, <laughs> so I have a three-year-old daughter and uh, as all parents, I hope she gets to grow up healthy and strong. And especially in an era where gender equality is a huge topic in society, um, we hope that she can withstand all the challenges that come at her, both from a academic, physical, as well as from a gender perspective. Um, I think this is helpful to destigmatize mental health, just as Osaka has done a couple of months ago um, in one of the tennis international competitions to um, kind of demystify mental health. Because um, we see people like athletes, it's perfect. They never lose their mind. They always calm. They perform perfectly. They're just these superhumans that don't have any flaws. And that's what a lot of kids ex aspire themselves to be. But at the same time, acknowledging that uh, we're all human and anybody can be subject to a lot of stress. And um, when having the choice of whether to um, um, hide it and, and say like, I don't have stress, I don't have that kind of problems, um, to choose to disclose, especially publicly, that um, it is something that they're going through, I think is hugely helpful. Um, one of the most common things I hear um, when I treat um, kids who come in for suicide attempts in the hospital is that their parents have no idea that they were depressed. Um, this, I would say like 90% of parents would tell me we did not know that my kids were going through a hard time. And, and I think part of it is the social pressure of appearing to be okay when you're really not okay. Um, and I think this symbolism coming from an Olympic champion is really helpful to destigmatize mental health and to promote this early reach out for help um, when help is available. I think that's perf that's perfectly said, um, Dr. Xie, because I think that at the end of the day, what we need more of in society, I think not less, is um, modeling of self-compassion. And um, there's, you know, there are role models that are in, uh, of influence. Um, we, we model, we, you know, excellence modeling abounds. <laughs> we have no shortage of that. Uh, and so um, I think it's okay uh, if, if we can model self-compassion with, with such degree of rigor as well. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Mo La Shi, uh, kind of going back to the causes of mental health issues. Does your study imply that children's mental health in urban China generally is better situation than in rural China because of their better parental support? Or in other words, what are the biggest factors that have impact on mental health, such as the school support that you mentioned, available health services? Yeah, I can, I can start with this one. Um, actually, um, what we see uh, in our data at REAP, and also there's a national um, survey on mental health in China, and they release report every year. Um, both, you know, our study and the national representative survey show that actually rural um, population have higher prevalence of mental health. So for example, depression, um, the prevalence among rural population is about 16% and versus urban population is um, 14%. So it's not, um, mental health is only a problem among rural population or urban population. This problem is everywhere in China. And what we can see from our data, um, you know, when we're looking at the correlation, like the, you know, the drivers of mental health that, you know, 
uh, that you know family background characteristics that are associated with mental health issues. What we see in rural China, it's ex especially high among the left behind children, and also with um, you know poorer families. So the the families who are at the bottom quartile of family asset in index in our sample, they show a higher rate of mental health. And recently, I've been working with Manpreet and Xing on another kind of data set. We're looking at the uh, caregivers, you know, grandparents and parents of the students, their mental health, how that um, correlates with student mental health. What we've seen is when the caregiver, either it's grandparents or parents, when they are experiencing anxiety, depression, or stress, their students are doing way worse in their own mental health resilience level and academic performance. So when the parents are experiencing, you know, this kind of mental health issues, the students' academic performance will be behind for about you know a year of learning, so that's like a huge kind of you know driver of you know the mental health um, problems for both caregivers and the students. So we're still trying to you know gather more data on what's the biggest you know factors that impact mental health, and you know hopefully um, you know we can find like a magical recipe and you know solve the, this issue but as you know Manpreet and you know Dr. Xing mentioned this is a really kind of comprehensive you know problem that requires a wholesome intervention from the school the society and the family level so um, that's my take on this it's not like one thing that makes rural or urban experience more on the mental health issues and it's you know the problem is is universal and the you know the fact there are multiple factors that are driving this issue and i i think let me just add one thing i i think if you look at china versus the rest of the world you see these extremely high levels of stress and anxiety much much higher than anyone and uh, i can tell you it's uh, you know it's the SAT based entrance exam, it's the college entrance exam uh, issue in that, you know, the, co the competition is so severe. Um, we, we had we, one of our big collaborators in, is in Sichuan and her daughter did a internship as a high school student and we met her at Stanford. She then went back in the, she was in one of the best schools in, in Chengdu in the middle of Sichuan. And I met her about three years later. She was a junior in high school, you know, already gearing up for exam. And I said, how's things going uh, in school? And she says, oh my gosh, the Chengdu government just passed a new rule and we're so happy about it. What's the new rule? You can only be in school, in school, 15 and a half hours per day. Is that you can't, we had been, they were, they had been in school 17 and 18 hours per day. Get, get, and they're only juniors in, in, in high school, right? And, and so I think that that's a huge part of it. And, um, you know, I, I, uh, and that's true for both rural and urban. And, uh, and it's both, and kids who aren't doing well in school, they're sort of giving up and then it becomes this depression. And the kids who are doing good, the stress is so high Right, that it, that so that there's the both ends of the spectrum. I, I think that that's where we have, and I'm sure these exact same things happen in the U.S. It's in our new competitive system that a newer, newer, more and more competitive system that we have. Yes, it's so true. It reminds me. Your anecdote, um, Scott, reminds me of um, needing to advocate uh, to eliminate zero period here in the Palo Alto um, school districts where where there was a, a, a significant aggressive push to be able to start uh, at 6 a.m. And what it was doing was encroaching on children's sleep. So, you know, I think it piggybacks on um, Shin's uh, point before, it, you know, I, it may sound flippant to say we should vigorously um, demonstrate excellence and self-compassion just as much, but even performance athletes need rest all of us humans need rest and real rest. Uh, our brains need rest. Um, growing and developing brains need it even more. So adolescence, by the way, is a time when kids actually on average need 10 to 12 hours of sleep a night. 
think about that in terms of your educational curriculum and schedules. 10 to 12 hours doesn't exist. So what do children typically do? They sleep five, six, sometimes downwards, pull all-nighters already in high school. And then they catch up on sleep over the weekend. That's normal. We would expect a child to sleep in until two or three in the afternoon if they're so sleep deprived during the week, right? But is that really healthy for their brain development? I was 16 and I was sleeping too much and I thought it was pathological <laughs> because I thought I needed to stay up to educate myself. But, you know, the combination of exercise, daily routines and sleep, but getting sleep is vital. And it is our jobs as a society to protect children's sleep. So these are, you know, kinds of, these are broad scale, universal prevention strategies that we can already begin to think about and take seriously as we've become in our post-industrial ways, so preoccupied with pursuit of excellence and pursuit of knowledge and pursuit of money or whatever it is. It's, it's I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to get into polemics or anything like that, but I just, I think it's really important uh, for us to reorient ourselves to what our bodies and brains need and um, what our children need so that we can um, get back to doing the things that we do so well, which is thriving as a species. Many thanks to uh, your, all our panelists and appreciate all the work you're doing and thanks for being here today. I noticed that we're running out of time, so um, sorry we can't answer all the questions, but um, there are some reading materials that the uh, organizers sent out earlier. So um, thank you very much and um, back to you, Margaret. Thank you, Shin and Scott, Manpreet, and Shu and Juan. Those are some really startling statistics that you shared. Thank you for all of the really difficult work you're doing to tackle this critical, 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 critical issue. But the one silver lining I see is that all of you talented people are working on this. So thank you again for that.